Hey, everybody, welcome back to Final Residence TV and episode number 33 of Van Halen Stories. Today, I have my two special guests, Kurt Granger, my good friend from way back. We went to the 1984 show together in Birmingham on January 31st, 1984. We'll talk a little bit about that today. But today, I have Ruben Reza, who was a previous guest here on Van Halen Stories early on. And, and Ruben was also with Kurt. And what we're going to talk about today is the US Festival in 1983. Kurt drove all the way across country to be at the US Festival for all that day. It was uh, what was it May 29th? That's right. That's that's the the heavy metal day. I actually drove out a couple of weeks earlier with my best friend at the time and my '73 Super Sport Chevy Nova with no no AC. So <laughs> <laughs> in the early part of the summer, so I guess it was hot. <laughs> it was very hot. Arizona in May is not something you want to do in a 73 Nova. <laughs> right. So, how, Kurt, how did you find out about the festival and get ticketing and all of that? Well, my friend Jeff Johnson uh, had his, his ear to, to some source and found out, and he convinced me, hey, we need to get tickets and go to this. We'll take your car, and it'll be it'll be great. And he was right. <laughs> <laughs> and you were, but, how old, you were how old then? 17. Yeah. Wow. So you found out about it. Ruben, how did you find out about it? Well, uh, in, in high school, you know, all my friends were just talking about this concert and uh, commercials were all over the TV, the US Festival and, you know, all the bands that were going to play that day. So uh, that's how I found out. And, you know, I beg, I was 16 years old and I went with my younger brother, Jimmy. He was 14. And um I just begged my parents <laughs> let me go because <laughs> uh, because honestly that ended up that was actually my very first concert of ever in my whole life wow. was the Oz Festival so that was kind of a a wild uh, you know inauguration into concerts uh, the Oz Festival a high bar <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> I saw a ticket sell that said it was thirty seven fifty is that sound right. That was twenty one fifty actually. Twenty one fifty, okay. Twenty one fifty. I, think, I yeah. think our tickets were like twenty dollars, maybe twenty one yeah. fifty with tax or whatever. But yeah. Wow, that's amazing. You know, I, I over the last few days since we were going to be on together, I started kind of doing some research on the location of the US Festival, Glen Hill and Regional uh, Park. It's still, of course, there, and there's also a venue there still, uh, the Glen Hill and it's called currently the Glen Hill and uh, Amphitheater. It holds, they say, sixty five thousand people still. It's on the site. I don't know exactly the orientation. I've seen some drone footage and kind of try to compare it to the where the lakes are and all that. Ruben, do you know if it's orientated the same way or? You know what? I'm trying to think because years ago, um, I took our oldest daughter and uh, some friends of her to to that to the concert there at Glen Helen, whatever it's called now. Yeah, we, it was Lincoln Park, Corn, Snoop Dogg, right? You know, right. The, these like pop punk bands. And it was just wild to actually go back there because I hadn't gone back since 1983 and to see an actual a parking lot, <laughs> to right. see you know, no dirt and actual seats and, a, you know, a stage built out, a permanent stage built out. Um, as far as like the orientation, I almost want to say um, it probably is this built the same because I just remember the hill, the, the direction of the sun and that day. Um, taking my daughter and her friends, it, it was basically facing the same direction. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it was it was kind of wild to go back and see it more of a permanent, you know, venue. So let me ask you this about the or the orientation and the the hill. It looks to be anyway now uh, a fairly de- a slow slope kind of natural amphitheater drop that just goes for a long way. Is that is that right? Yeah, it, it, the the slope isn't as dramatic. As what I remember in '83 and '83, I remember it just being like a hill. I remember like when they opened the uh, the gates or whatever to let people go get in because they're all standing waiting for these doors to open or gates or whatever. And I remember it was quite an incline going up and then going back down into where the concert was. Um, so it's a little bit more um, not as steep, you know. Okay, I remember seeing that footage. There's a footage of everybody going in that gate over a hill, <laughs> and it looks like a motocross track or something. But I know yeah, that I know they have a motocross track out there, but it looked like you know there there was a whole bunch of different areas out there for recreation and stuff. And I guess there still is. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing that 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 it still exists. And and I've been wanting to go to San Bernardino, but it's quite a ways from you, right? 
I mean, from where I live now, when I went in 83, I lived in East LA and now I live up in Santa Clarita, which is about um, half an hour north of North Hollywood. So yeah, San Bernardino is probably a couple hours away from me now. Right, right. Because because Randy Rhodes' grave is out there. That's that's one of the reasons I want to go out. To, yeah, to, I've been there a few times. Yeah. Have you been out there? Yeah, that's amazing. So, so you got walk me, Kurt. Walk through me. Walk me through the day uh, and that day in particular. That what you remember about getting in and and um, the morning before. And you know, you you drove out there. You were there for a few days. You said before, right? Yeah, a uh, couple of weeks or about two weeks. We we did a lot of things, Jeff and I. We we visited uh, Dolores Rhodes, which is Randy's mom's music school, Musonia, mm-hmm. and uh, did a little tour there and got some photos and all that. Met uh, his mom and Randy's former guitar teacher. Uh, we saw uh, Return of the Jedi on opening day in Hollywood. Stood uh-huh. in line for two or three hours. That kind of I think that was the twenty fifth. Uh, and just uh, we got lost several times. We were seventeen and didn't know what we were doing, and had had uh, less than I don't know a hundred dollars cash between us and my dad's credit card. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, we we got there, you know, and we camped out the big the big uh, flat campground area next to the big hill. Uh, set up a tent and uh, camped out there, and of course, you know, on uh, on the 29th, we got in line and hiked up the hill and when they opened the gates you went over the hill and just saw this huge expanse of people that were already there and of course you know the sun it was there's was, no clouds in the sky it was sunny all day i got sunburned really bad mm-hmm. <laughs> no shade uh i found some spotlight towers in the back and uh, a few times during the day they took refuge in this little tiny space behind the the spotlight stand where there was maybe two foot of shade. So that's kind of way it was really hot that, that day. I think everybody that was there pretty much remembers that, my God, it's hot. <laughs> yeah, I think they said the year before it was, uh, I was watching a thing with the B 52s, uh, the, the girl from the B 52s, and she said the year before it was 112 degrees and it was uh, dust so dusty that it, she, she remembered the dust. It was a dusty, dusty that time too for you guys. I don't time. remember the dust so much as the heat and the sun. I, it probably was. I mean, it was pretty dry, I think, but you know, but it was it was really really hot. It was it was dry heat, so it wasn't miserable, you know, like Alabama in, in autumn. I mean, in uh, in uh, August, August, but uh, very very hot anyway. Right. But uh, you you just kind of get used to it after a few minutes, and when the bands are playing, it was just you know, Motley Crue's playing, Ozzy's playing, you just forget about all that. For a few minutes and right was, uh, so kurt for you where did you end up mostly uh i just kind of wandered around but okay. it was never up close i never i mean so many people for so long you know you know 150 to 200 yards maybe more of people just compressed there's no way to to get through all that so you're, i just wandered around kind of like in the back and uh okay. Yeah, I mean, I, when you watch the videos, it looks like it looks ginormous. And, and usually, when you, you have to see video, it's bigger than the video. <laughs> you know what I mean? So when yeah. you when you look at the video now, Carter Rubin, do you feel like it was even bigger than we perceived it to be? Yeah, I mean, like I said, that was my first concert exposure, so. Um, I didn't really have anything to compare that to, but I was like, wow, there's a lot of people here. And in my spot, I guess being that it was my first concert, I didn't know what to expect or how people were going to behave or whatever. So me and my little brother, Jimmy, we just kind of found a spot almost like dead center, you know, a ways back, but dead center to the stage. And we pretty much stood there the the entire day. Um, But yeah, there was, tons of people you know, i know kurt you remember they had two towers and they had water can and just shooting people like from the center around doing whatever they could to get you know people uh just get them you know not not have them burn up in the sun because same yeah. thing here i got badly sunburned i wasn't prepared for it um i had an iron maiden t-shirt i think a pair of jeans on or shorts tennis shoes i don't even know if i had a baseball cap and uh, a blanket and my little brother had the same thing, and my dad gave us a wad of cash, and that's all we had <laughs> for the day. And it was just, uh, it, it was interesting. But how we got there, it, when Kurt mentioned the campsite, 
like I, I don't know, Kurt. I have a feeling my story is going to be a, very different than yours, uh, being that it's my first concert experience. So my dad took us. Actually, my dad and my mom drove all the way from East LA to San Bernardino. I don't know if he had a Thomas guide out. Uh, how he got us there, I was just like excited. We're going to the Us Festival, so we get into San Bernardino, and you know we think we're where the concert site is. So my dad's like, okay, yeah, there's people here. There's a campsite, blah, blah, blah. The, the rockers, you see a lot of people along here. So we figured, okay, this is the Us Festival is where, where it's going to happen the next morning because we got dropped off the night before. Um, so they drop us off and, you know, we have our blanket under our arm, just kind of walking around. And then uh, I started asking people, hey, where's the venue? Um, so because we wanted to kind of get ready, get close to the doors or whatever, so in the morning, we can just go right in. And we were dropped off actually about six miles away from, oh, wow. from the actual venue. People are like, oh, and that's down the freeway. It's just like six miles down. We're like, what? Um, my, by that time, my parents were long gone. They had turned around, went back home. So no cell phone, nothing. We're, we had to figure it out. So the morning comes. We're up all night because we don't have a tent. We don't know anybody. We're just dropped off there, 14, 14 and 16-year-old. So we're just walking around this campground all night long until the sun comes up. And then the sun comes up. And I kid you not, I, I wish they would have had video of this because this is pretty epic. It was almost like Woodstock. Just all these people from this campground, we were walking on the side of the freeway, just walking to the venue. There was a couple of times where we were able to get rides, like hop on the back of a truck for, you know, a quarter mile, half a mile a mile. So one time my brother jumped on and he fell right back out and he got his knees chewed up. It was pretty bad. But <laughs> but we we had a like we had quite a ways away to get down to the venue and and that was like how we got in and um we finally got there. We saw the hill, we just stood around, and waited, you know, with everybody for the gates to open. But that is how we got from where I live down to the US Festival. You told me it was cold. Uh, didn't you tell me it was cold that night before? Well, you're in the desert. So, yeah, it's like one extreme or the other. So, you know, San Bernardino at night in the summer, it's super cold. And in the daytime, like Kurt said, it was just a dry heat. And and uh, as far as, like, the dust goes, I mean, everybody was so packed in together. I don't think there's room for any dust to, to kick around because it's just right. everybody's just right, right in there. Right, um, but yeah, desert desert at night is very cold. So you, you know the the once you get into the get into the the venue, what time was it when you all came in there? Man, that's a good question. Early, early. yeah, I just remember early. being early on lots of people. Ago. I don't remember. I was gonna say, but then, <laughs> didn't Motley Crue start first, and that was probably what in the morning, right? Yes. Quiet Riot started first. Oh, okay. Quiet Riot, yeah, that's right. Quiet Riot, and then Motley. Okay, so how early in the morning was that? You know, roughly? Nine-ish? Yeah, it was, it was pretty early. I'd say nine or ten, you know, wow. the Quiet Riot came on. Um, they did a, you know, I think just a regular set, on half an hour, 40 minutes. I don't remember. But, you know, I will say this. And, and actually, I've sent Carlos Cavazzo a message on Instagram, <laughs> and then he responded, uh, I, I, you know, uh, we all love Eddie Van Halen. You know, that's why we're here talking. Um, but to me, the tone that Carlos had that day was humongous. You know, he had this big, you know, stereo, just a little bit of chorus splitting this guitar sound. And it was like one of the, the biggest tones I ever heard in my life. I was like, man, that sounds really good. So um, so what did Carlos say when you in it, send him that? Oh, message? when I sent him that message, he, he responded. He was like totally taken aback. He's like, hey, man, thank you. He's like, nobody's ever even talked about that <laughs> concert. And I go, yeah, I just remember your tone being so big and huge. And and he was really, you know, he thanked me. He's like, hey, thanks a lot, man. And, and that was it. You know? so back, <laughs> yeah, in, really great time. back in the ancient days of those older PAs, did it's, the PA sound pretty good? Uh, well, <laughs> wow. well I, I mean really good you know what i had noticed and uh, you know i'm only 16 years old i've been playing guitar i think at that time i started playing when i was like 14 years old so i was really into like you know guitar players and kind of 
hearing what everybody's doing, Mick Mars and Carlos and all that. But I, I think for the bands like Quiet Riot, as Motley Crue, they were still tweaking, you know, the sound. So yeah. you get a lot of weird level changes and drops and, you know, um, with those first two bands, like you would hear the guitar at one point, then there was no guitar. So I think they were just basically, you know, mm-hmm. using Quiet Riot and Motley Crue for right, getting ready for when Ozzy comes out, you know, make sure everything's dialed in. Um so, but as far as once they got it dialed in, you know, again, me not knowing what to compare that to, um, especially being outdoors, I, I thought it sounded great. Yeah. Uh, you know, when I think back about 88, when I went to see Monsters of Rock in Memphis, because that's kind of like the only time I ever had that kind of large, super large experience. Were you at that, Kirk? I was. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I'm trying to think about what it sounded like. You know, I just remember that it did vary depending on the band. And, you know, some bands like Scorpions were really tight sounding, you know, and then, uh, of course, Metallica was brand new then. And, and, uh, they sounded good. Everything sounded pretty good. It was just those that it was, you know, way before any kind of line arrays or whatever it was more. Right. I don't know if it's more brutal. I guess it was more brutal back then. <laughs> 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 From all the interviews, you know, if I, and when I think back about, the uh, point point of source kind of PAs, they were just brutal. <laughs> well, yeah, I've seen Van Halen sixteen times. I've never heard him sound bad. <laughs> right, 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 for sure. Always sounded great. So, Kurt, for you, you know, the first two acts. How did you feel about those two? You did you know him very well? You knew? Did you know Crew that well? Or uh, Jeff was more of a fan of Motley Crue than I was. But at the time, we were just starting, you know, to play guitar. I think I've been playing about a year, so I was familiar with. Some of the some of the licks, uh, some of the riffs, uh, but I thought they they all sounded great. Uh, I've watched a lot of the videos since, and uh, just you know, it's pretty much what I remembered. Right. Uh, but they were all you know all the bands like like Ruben said you know once they got the the levels and all that worked out, uh, it was a great sounding show the rest of the day. Scorpion sounded like you said extremely tight. Uh, Triumph sounded really good. Right, that's uh, that's an amazing video. You know, when you watch back Triumph, you know, I think Rick Rick Emmett it just he just made a comment about Van Halen that day, saying I don't think it was their best day. <laughs> 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 you know, we'll get into that, but but yeah, Triumph. You know, when I watched that, I think you know I don't. I'm pretty sure that was broadcast live, right? Uh, well, they. You mean for the for the audience there? We had there were two big screens there. I don't know if it went like out for, live. I watched it. I watched it uh, at some point, but maybe that was when they did the edit and they put out the little comp of you know even Van Halen was like three songs instead of whatever. I don't right. think that, I'm not sure that MTV filmed the whole thing or ran the whole thing. I can't remember exactly, but but I do you know. And in, in retrospect, I've seen it all at this point. But um, yeah. It, it, yeah, and then when you know you're talking about after when Ozzy came on, which for me, you know, at, at that point I was pretty aware of Jake E. Lee, and uh, man, yeah, I think that was one of Jake's early shows with Ozzy, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Yeah, he had been with Ozzy already, like later in the previous year. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I think he done like some European dates or something like that. I think this might have been his first American show with Ozzy, the Oz Festival. Definitely, yeah. He just he just mentioned that. Why well, didn't just mention it? But I just saw him mention it on Dave Freeman's uh, podcast, where he somebody asked him about what it was like to walk out on that stage in front of all those people, and he said it's just like he- heads as far as you could see. I mean, I don't think people realize. I mean, I think they do when they look at the video, but you know, it's like can you imagine like a crowd so big that you can't see the end of it? <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like, a, have you ever seen the the footage of kiss in the rock and Rio? I think it's like 83. And there's like a shot of Gene Simmons doing this thing with the fist. And you just see an ocean of people and it's, you know, it's almost like that. It's just, it, 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 I mean, if I was Jake Lee and I'd come out and you just see that in front of you and you're like, wow, that, that, that's, that's overwhelming. You know, <laughs> you know what he said though? He said, as I'm about to go on, I can't remember how over the mountain starts. <laughs> <laughs> I heard 
that. <laughs> and, he, and he goes, he yeah, goes, I ran, I ran to my tech and I go, how does it go? And he goes, da, da, da. And he goes okay, I got it. <laughs> and then he hit the stage in front of God, how many people that were there. You know, there, there's, mm-hmm. there's, there's different estimates on the total number of people that, that was said like 670 over the weekend, 670,000, you know, most everybody that was uh, the biggest crowd was obviously the day you guys were there. Um, I don't know if it was a quarter million people, but it probably was at least. You think three hundred thousand, three fifty? I've heard three three hundred fifty thousand. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I would say that that day was just insane, and it, and I can't really think of. I mean, maybe another, maybe the Woodstock stuff late and later on. You know, other than the obvious Woodstock, uh, we were close in numbers, but. Yeah, for our generation, it was our Woodstock. I've heard that said a zillion times, you know, for sure. Okay. That was our Woodstock. And so when Ozzy came out, I mean, Ozzy, you know, this is, you know, Ruben, you were talking about Musonia. Kurt, did you go to Musonia? Yes. Yeah. Jeff Ruben, and I went. Ruben, you said that. Ruben, did you tell me that? Did I tell you what? You, did you went to the Musonia before? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I went there a, a few times, met Mrs. Rhodes a few times. Um, yeah. Uh, actually, uh, Randy Rhodes is like the reason I took guitar playing seriously. You know, yeah. uh, I just, a friend of mine was selling a guitar. I didn't know anything about the guitar. I bought the guitar, I lost ball copy. And then uh, I got a book, ACDC Back in Black, and I saw Malcolm Young. And that's what I wanted to be in Malcolm Young. I'm like, okay, this is that's I want to be that guy. So I learned everything on Back in Black, and then I heard Randy Rhodes' Crazy Train, and then I'm like, okay, I really want to play guitar like that. Um, so that was like in the '80s. And I was a huge Randy Rhodes fan, and um, there was a store in Hollywood back in the day called Guitars R Us, a little tiny shop, yeah, right down the street from you know, yeah. Uh, and the owner there, Al, he was just uh, the nicest guy. But to me, I'm sure he was nice to a lot of people, but he would just, I would go in there, hang out, play guitars, and he would let me take a guitar home just off the wall. You want it? Here, take it, try it for a week, grab the case. If you want it, you know, buy it. If not, just bring it back. So anyway, um, I had bought this 1974 Les Paul Custom, just like Randy's. Back in the day, I bought it in 86, $650 on the wall. <laughs> and I bought this guitar and I went down and I met, you know, Dolores, went down to Sonia. And that was probably like one of the most emotional days I had because had walking into Masonia, seeing her down, you know, there's like a little foyer and these steps go down and there's a room where she teaches the band, the music room. And I see her there and she's working with the students. And then she sees me and she kind of waves like, you know, give me a minute. I'll be right with you. One of those things. And I'm like, yeah, cool. So she comes over and I mean, I knew she was Dolores, but I just had to have that validation. I'm like, are you, are you Randy's mom? This is Rose. And she said, yeah. And I kid you not, dude, as soon as she said that, I just started like weeping. My eyes just like, you know, wild up and, and she's like, it's okay. It's okay. I'll take it easy. Blah, blah, blah. So I introduced myself and, you know, then she was super kind. She was still giving a class and she gave me one of Randy's cards, wrote her number on the back and says, call me back. You know, we'll set up an appointment. You can come down, ask any questions you want. I'll show you anything you need that I have here on Randy. And so I went back and she actually signed my, the back of my 74 Les Paul. Um, best wishes, Dolores Rhodes. Best wishes, Ruben, Dolores Rhodes. She misspelled my name. She put I N instead of E N. And, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, yeah, it was funny, but it was back there on the back of my Les Paul. And, uh, you know, I'm going to cut, sorry for like hijacking this piece, but oh. that Les Paul, um, maybe about uh, a couple months later, I had some friends coming from New York. They were Randy Rhodes pen pals. So they came from New York and are showing around town. We went to go visit Dolores. You know, they got to meet her, all that stuff. Um, I was in a band and we had a gig at, during that visit at the Whiskey. Um, and we were rehearsing, my band rehearsed in downtown L.A. And one of the nights that these people, these friends of mine were here, I, I wanted to pick them up in Hollywood to show them around. So I went straight from rehearsal to Hollywood I had a little 1977 Toyota Celica, I think. And I put my Les Paul in the back, in the trunk of the car, went from rehearsal all the way over to um, 
to Hollywood to pick up uh, my friends. We're hanging out. We do the whole thing, the Hollywood Wax Museum, blah, blah, blah. Um, on the way back to the car to take them back to the hotel, I noticed on the trunk of my Celica, um, there's a yellow wire sticking out. And this is a wire that I would use to tie down my 412 carving cab in the back. It would stick out of my car. Right, right. I'm like, that's odd. This is peculiar. I, that, that wasn't sticking out when I put the guitar in. So all of a sudden, all these crazy things start racing into my mind. And I, I run to the car because I see it from a block away that that wire sticking out. I get out my car keys and I, I try to open the trunk and it's not opening. The lock is jammed. It's like somebody messed with the lock. I couldn't get my key in there, but after messing with it for a bit, I finally was able to open the trunk. My guitar was gone. Um, my 74 Les Paul with Randy's mom's signature gone. I don't know how that happened or who knew I had that in the back. So I'll, I'll fast forward. I actually, um, the week after that, when Monday comes, I was around, I go back to Guitars R Us and I tell Al, Albert, I said, hey, this is the story. This is what happened. And he was blown away. And, and I just had the invoice. We never wrote down the serial number on the invoice. Yeah. So he's like, you know, I'll keep an eye out for it. Because, you know, he bought and sold guitars at that little shop. Um, so after about a year, we just say, forget it. The guitar's not coming back. And, and I kind of kind of stopped going to Guitars R Us. You know, I, I don't know why. Maybe it was just memories of that guitar and it's no longer mine. Right. So I stopped going. So about a year later, I'm, I'm at uh, another store called West LA Music in Santa Monica, so taking a friend to get a guitar. And on the way back, Steve I was doing something at Carvin, I think. Um, but I got back too late. So I didn't get to see that. But I thought, well, let me go see Albert, see how he's doing. So I go into the shop. And he sees me and he's blown away because we hadn't seen each other in about a year. And then he just looks at me. He's like, you know, the drill. I'm like, yeah. So I just went and started looking at guitars, pulling stuff down. And he always had this section on the wall of like the cream Les Pauls, like five or eight of them, you know, just huddled together. So I'm looking at them. Then just one just kind of sticks out. And um, I'm like, man, something about that one cream Les Paul in the middle of the other. I pull it down. I start playing it and all of a sudden I get all these chills and I flip it over and on the back where Randy signed, Randy's mom signed it, there was scratches, like somebody scratched off that signature and uh -huh. I'm like, this is my guitar. And then Albert looks at me and he's like, what's going on? Cause he saw me get all emotional. I'm like, Albert, this is my guitar. This is my guitar. Um, He's like, what do you mean? The one that got stolen? I go, yeah, this is this is my last Paul. And he's like, I believe you. He's like, totally, I believe you. Um, just let me hold on to it for a couple of days. I need to do something, blah, blah, blah. And uh, after a couple of days, I got my guitar back. Three years later, the guitar was recovered. Um, so, you know, that's there's more to it, but I, I'm sorry I've hijacked like. No, you know, that's, that's, a, that's, that's crazy. That's a there's great. There's a lot story. more. There's a lot more to that story. Um, but <laughs> yeah, th that just going back to the whole, you know, Randy Rhodes' mom and I got the guitar back, and I went back to Mizzonia. You know, I met Randy's mom again, and she signed it again, exactly <laughs> the same, and she misspelled my name again. <laughs> Which is hilarious. I'm like, okay, hey, you know, it wouldn't be any other way if it wasn't misspelled. And I remember t her telling me, she's like, keep that guitar within arm's reach because, you know, it's a <laughs> yeah. story. Wow. She was just the nice, nicest lady. Just, I'm, yeah. I'm I was going to say, Kurt, you met her too. Did you get that same vibe? Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, super gracious. And that's one thing that you and I uh, have in common, Ruben. I have her autograph too. So, <laughs> oh, so. <laughs> Yeah, but she was she was very gracious and allowed us to take, you know, I had my dad's really nice Pentax camera. So she she allowed us to take photographs of a lot of her personal photos of Randy. And, uh, you know, we photo all his his old Ampeg that he had there and a lot of his gear. And uh, we, we stayed there for maybe almost two hours. And then a lot of her students got together in the rehearsal room. She's like, OK, we've got to we got to end this now because they're going to perform together. And this is a closed session. So she 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 kindly, you know, invited us, uh, you know, the, everything's everything's done now. But uh, it was a wonderful experience. She's super gracious. And, uh, you know, it was a, it was one of the highlights of the trip, actually. So. Right. You know, and any any discussion with Eddie Van Halen always ends up with the Randy Rhodes discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow, right? Right. It's not for Eddie. It's not for Eddie. 
Uh, you know, there, there's all that, there's all those discussions about their rivalry and everything. And everybody I go to, you know, says it wasn't the case. You know, most of the people that were in the, in the, in the, you know, right there with those guys said that it wasn't the case. But I'm sure there was, you know, Eddie would always says he was protecting his technique and he was doing that, which is obvious. And I'm sure that there was some of that. But, but yeah, I, I've always wanted to go there too. I haven't gone yet. Uh, I had a friend who knows his sister um nelson blanton who's been on here before and uh, i'm hoping to meet her at some point and maybe next time i'm out there maybe we'll see what happens but yeah <laughs> so the so ozzy comes on and uh mark weiss was on here uh or actually on musical journeys like you were kurt um on my other podcast and mark weiss made the outfit that that ozzy came out on stage with the crazy outfit with the feathers yeah, the witch doctor outfit or whatever that was. And Mark Wise got the outfit shipped into his, his studio because they were going to do a photo shoot, right? And and Ozzy ran out of time, I think it was. I think that's the story. But Mark did, Mark was like, I'm going to break this thing open and check it out. So he broke it open and he took pictures in the outfit. Like, <laughs> naked though. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe in his book, a decade that rocked there were some pictures of that in, that he opened in that outfit before it was actually used <laughs> <laughs> so what's your recollection of ozzy and, and jakey lee at that well um me for me being the super huge randy rhodes fan this is right. 1980 so randy passed away this is the so Randy had just passed away like a um so it's you know and a lot of Randy fans their hearts um were okay you know I saw, you know I have the Speak of the Devil right I saw the, the video with Ozzy and Ryan Meadows for the Speak of the Devil tour and right. I really you know enjoyed um really like Brad Gibbs what he did with Randy's song his interpretation and especially what he did on Speak that his work was awesome you know and his talent was um so then you know jakey lee is is the new guy so for me i'm like okay you know i want to see this new guy and how he does the randy stuff so yeah i'm i'm only been playing a couple years but i'm like you know thinking like okay nobody can touch randy etc and then um jakey lee comes out and from a tone perspective, you know, later in the years, like the Diary of Mad Mentor, Randy had this really big guitar sound and um, they had some modulations, some chorus and out in the front. They would do that on the desks and then they had stereo delay going. You can hear some of the, the diary, you know, soundboard tapes. And, you know, he really had he was really finally getting like his, his tone together on that second tour. And then you got Brad Gillis, who almost had the same thing. He had a stereo set up, a little bit of modulation. And probably like you know a short delay to split that sound to get that big stereo sound but then you get jakey lee and you know i guess hearing brad gillis what he sounded like and hearing randy rose what he sounded like i guess in my mind that was having that expectation of you know he's going to have a similar guitar sound but jakey lee he came out and it was like bone dry it was like dry like the san bernardino desert you know it was just a very dry direct sound mm -hmm. um but it was still you know big and warm and, and full mm -hmm. um but what really really impressed me because i had never heard anything like that in my life prior to and I, i'm i'll, I'll you know, I'll compare it to Jimi Hendrix when he did the, the, the his solo spot in Suicide Solution, you know, while the band's holding that A rhythm behind him and he's playing over that. Mm -hmm. um, the things he was doing with the, uh, you know, when he tuned the guitar down that low E and started faking those uh, tremolos and then he had some flanger on there and just the ends and, and then he was doing the thing with the thumb. Um, those sounds I had never heard anybody do, and, and just not only the technique and the sound, but you know, Jakey Lee, you know, he just had that soul behind those notes. You know, even when he played like the Randy solos, when he does the Crowley, he, he kind of made it home. You know, he he, you know, he paid homage to the key parts in all the songs and the solos, but that feel that Jakey had, and I was like, okay, this guy's 
great. <laughs> you know, uh, I really, I really, really um, liked what I heard. And I think at the beginning, though, uh, uh, before Over the Mountain started, um, and I think Jakey Lee says something about it, this in an interview, like he like hit a chord or two before you know to check his guitar and yeah and uh yeah and i thought that was like a flubber i'm like what's this guy doing why is he playing the guitar there and they haven't started yet um but other than that no i i I really you know i was happy i'm like okay ozzy's got a good guy you know this guy is amazing um and the fact that he didn't have a bar you know randy wasn't really much of a bar guy you know he had the bar in his jackson and his polka dot v primary played the last fall but you know to jump from that to Brad Gillis was like all about the Floyd Rose and using the bar a, a lot oh, sure. and going to a guy that just had nothing like that, just a straight Stratocaster hardtail yeah. and to pull off all that stuff, you know, and, and make it sound great and believable. Like, I'm like, yeah, this, this guy's. Yeah. I was going to, I was going to tell you in 84, I saw him um, when uh, I think it was when they did with crew and him uh, came through and I happened to be front row in front of Jake. I mean, you know, against the wall. And dude, I was blown away. I was like, man, holy crap, this guy's insane. And he was really great. And um, you're right about the tone, a different, a different thing for sure. And he, you know, as he pat- went on to Badlands and on, you know, we all kind of know how that tone kind of was in that same vein almost, you know. What'd you think, Kurt? Yeah. Um uh, Jake's tone was just incredible. I mean, and, and the same for for all the bands after Ozzy Taylor Scorpions Triumph, you know, they all had really refined, just you know, really great tone. And uh, leading into Eddie, you know, like you mentioned before, probably not one of their best nights, but you know, when he come when when Eddie came out to play and started playing, it's just you know the whole reckless abandon uh, reckless abandon thing is just so exciting, you know. It's like it's almost like you're on the seat of your pants, not knowing what's going to happen next. And, and of course, this is the first time I'd seen Van Halen. Sure, you know I'd listened to the albums, but I've never seen them live. Yeah, so so, the, so Van Halen, you know, watching the video, I, you know, there it it seems like they're really excited at first when they come out, you know, and Ed's oh yeah, and 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 he kind of he does that, you know, on those tapping things, and, he, and one of them he misses oh, yeah, just a right, lot. Yeah. He misses it a little bit. But uh, but man, the, they seem pretty together initially, anyway. And I think that I don't know if that's how it came off to you guys when you saw them. From everything I've read about their early days and the backyard parties, it just it seemed like to to me now that it was just one the biggest backyard party they'd ever done. Yeah, yeah. they 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 probably had that same. Let's part. We're here to party. We're here for to play music. For, for you to party and everybody's going to party and have a great time. And that's just kind of the vibe that came off, at least for me. Uh, you know, the Scorpions, just incredible band, super songs, super tight, sounded great, sounded a lot like the album. But when Van Halen plays, it's like, okay, you know, yeah, we're going to just let it rip and see what happens, you know. Right. You always get that. Vibe. You got that vibe like from the 84 Downington thing was kind of like, you know, not in their vein for 84 because 84 you and I saw very, you know, I wouldn't say choreographed show, but it was a very tight show when they went Structure, to yeah. when they went to Downington, they kind of had threw it out the window and it was kind of like 83, <laughs> like at us festival. I kind of felt like, you know, they hadn't been playing, they hadn't been touring. So they, they were kind of yeah. like in a thing where they were just going to go for it. And then, you know, and what you saw was at the 83 us. Festival. Well, you know, you know, obviously they have been partying a little bit beforehand. Everybody <laughs> right. stories about David Lee Roth and, and, and all that went on beforehand. But, right. you know, when you think about how many times they played all those parties before this, that they could just come out there and, and haven't, having taken off nine months or whatever it was since the, the previous tour and sure. just go out there and kill it like they did. And, you know, there it, it was loose, but, you know, it was a lot of fun, too, especially their live, because when you watch it now on video, it's like, yeah, it was a little sloppy here and a little off there. and But it was exciting because, you know, if you watch the interlude between uh, on Somebody Get Me a Doctor when Eddie and Alex were just tinkering, tinkering around, which yeah. ended up be, becoming a girl gone bad. You know, yeah, we right. heard that before anybody. <laughs> right, right. That was the Which day. So right? cool. Yeah. That was like, cool. You know, the next year you get the albums like, hey, I remember that. They played that at the US Festival. You know, it was <laughs> right. really cool. Ru- Ruben, what, you, did you feel the same way about Van Halen? Um, yeah. I mean, Chris said it exactly right because they, 
you know, they were done touring. You said it to you. They were done touring, so they didn't really have. Maybe they were out of the swing of what the, the normal day to day. This is the show one, show two, playing the same set that they knew what they were doing exactly. Nine months off, whatever. Like we got a show to do. Let's just go and and do it and have a great time. Um, but it, it's funny how like Chris said, yeah, but, you know, the Van Van Halen live to me. One thing I, I always loved about Van Halen live versus the record is, you know. Um, just that reckless abandon, you know, it doesn't sound exactly like the record, you know, the way Edward plays some of the solos. I mean, you see that on the, the fair warning, you know, he doesn't do the solo for Unchained uh, live, you know, the way he does on the record. Um, but it's funny how, you know, yeah, reckless abandon, but at the same time, how not calculated, but the whole thing with that video that they showed, you know, that backstage video yeah. that was actually shot a few days before. So it's like, okay, yeah, we got this gig we're going to do, but David Lee Roth is like, yeah, man, let's film the little video, you know, pretend like we're backstage there that night, but it's actually filming in a few days. And it was funny. I noticed that like immediately when I was watching that video on the big, well, there's just one screen, <laughs> you know, all they had back then was one small screen up over the stage, but I was watching that video and then, it, you know, they're all in robes and Eddie Van Halen, he has the Frankenstein, but he has that that odd rosewood neck that yeah. I think he had on the root guitar for a little bit. Yeah. And then when he comes out, like, on the stage a few minutes later, I'm like, hey, that's not the neck that was on the guitar, like, <laughs> two minutes ago. And so, like, oh, that's weird. I'm like, how do you do it that fast? And I was 16, so I'm like, yeah, he's Eddie Van Halen. He can do anything, you know, and squish it out really quick. Right. Um, the beat, but I, <laughs> the beat but I think, but um, for me, it's, it might be a little bit reversed as far as like Edward and Michael and Alex. I mean, when they came out, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, I was a little bummed out because these are my heroes, it's the whole reason I went to the US Festival, and to see them come out and they're like plastered and and David Lee Roth, and I was like, oh man. The, this is kind of bums me out, but I think towards the set, uh, as the set progressed, David Lee Roth continued to be just, you know, gone. You know, yeah, he just right, probably right, kept right. on drinking Jack Daniels every between every song. <laughs> but I think the buzz seemed to have worn off the band a little bit because uh, I think the band kind of stayed afloat or, you know, if even maybe have gotten just a little bit tired because i think for them you know they still wanted to play they enjoy playing but for david they it's just a different story i mean you, you see that whole right. 20 minutes or whatever before ice cream man <laughs> he's <laughs> you know he's just gone um but i do I, I do remember this i remember going back up i think it was during so this is love i had to go to the bathroom so i walked back to the top of the hill to where all the andy gums were and and i'm standing there and there's this guy next to me and he has his arms crossed and this is all he says to me. He just looks over at me. He's like, so what do you think? And you can tell in his face, he wasn't like really happy with the, the show. Right. I'm like, well, you know, you know, it's Van Halen. He's like, man, he, he just was, wasn't really happy with right. you know the, the way they were performing. But it, this is even funnier though, because when I did that spin mag thing, yeah. um, when I was talking to them and I was telling them about, you know, initially how, you know, a lot of people think Van Halen was, you know, probably the worst performance, but I think it was, you know, more David Lee Ross. And I think the band got a little bit better as, as a set progressed. But um, Spin Mag said that they also interviewed Michael Anthony. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not putting, you know, words in Michael Anthony's mouth, but they said that Mike thought the same, Mikey thought the same thing, that, hey, man, he thought they were actually did okay. Um, and I agree with that. I, I agree with that comment. But David Lee Roth, now he just kept on flying high on the band. <laughs> yeah, uh, you, uh, you, one of the things that sticks out to me though is like at the towards the end when, I mean, it's just like the the ultimate like Van, Ed, Ed, not Eddie, but David Lee Roth statement is the the the, the assless chaps. And the wild <laughs> abandon at the end of the freaking show, you know, during ain't talking about love, you just you're seeing all these camera shots from behind, and he's just go, it's just totally wild, right? <laughs> it, that, I was like, <laughs> yeah, I was like, at the, when you watch it and you go through that, you're like, yeah, yeah, but then at the end, you go, yeah, well, that's why these guys were who they were. I mean, this is this is the point, you know, it was like so beyond, like we, you know, people don't 
always says a lot of, some people in our community say this, but David Lee Roth was the biggest front man of, at the time of, in the world. I mean, Mick Jagger looked up to him, you know? Yeah. So it, it, it's hard to, you know, think that way now, but it's insane. Yeah. I will say this though, you know, we had quiet riot, Motley Crue, um, Ozzy, Judas Priest, Triumph, Scorpions, and Van Halen. And, I loved all those bands. It was, it was great for me to see all those bands, but um, when Van Halen came out, like I'm like I, I'm getting chills right now. I just when they came out and that stage was so bright, so many lights, it, it was like blinding bright the stage, and to hear that guitar sound that you hear on the records that tone to hear those notes live you know echoing through this big you know natural amphitheater just a hill and and just not only that then to see the band as as a as a team as a unit you know play like Rob just ultimate frontman rock star eddie van halen jumping around sliding around and they hear michael anthony's you know those background vocals and he's just like that's the voice and then alex van halen you know just a thundering you know playing his drum solo right at the second song we, we all know why he used to do that back then but to hear like all the four guys together and hear that music together and see the stage see it so brightly lit up it was just a bigger than life thing. I I just I was just overwhelmed. I just looked at it. I was like, oh my god, what is this? You know, well, you, know you, you could yeah. argue, you could argue that was the, the like the 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 pinnacle moment for these guys. They were they were this is the biggest stage that they would ever probably. I mean, I can't think of anything else bigger. I mean, they did festivals in Europe, but but this man, it, this lived on forever and still lives on forever and for to be there and uh, to be in the presence of that moment man uh, you know we all know that when you watch it through a tv screen especially back in the 80s you're, you're not seeing it <laughs> you know you're seeing something but you ain't seeing that and not feeling that you're not feeling that power and that that pa kurt how was that when you you saw that beginning that was like the same as ruben explained just overwhelming and you know it, it started cooling off and uh, it was night by then, so you know it was really, really enjoyable in that regard. And just the van was, you know, incredible. I mean, as loose as they were, they were still like, "This is Van Halen." You know, the first time you're seeing Van Halen's, like, "Hey, I finally see Van Halen for the first time," and it was just, it was a so that was your blowing. that was your first time to see Van Halen. Yes, it was. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing, man. Because Jeff had seen him a few times at Birmingham before, but I had never seen him. I was just, I had three of the records and. uh um, was just kind of getting up to speed that that previous year on on all the all the stuff that they were doing, and uh, I guess I was a late bloomer in that regard to Van Halen uh, as they came out. Yeah, um, like I said, I had the records, but I, you know, but that 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 moment changed everything. I mean, Van Halen playing live that 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 night just changed everything for me. And then you know, the following year or in '84 when I saw him in mm -hmm. uh, Birmingham, I mean, that cemented it. That was just okay. This is this is what I want to do because seeing them from way back here with three hundred fifty thousand people, and then being right there on the front row in eight four, and Eddie standing right in front of you playing, <laughs> just right. incredible. You know, incredible right. I, didn't, I didn't I didn't realize you were down front. Yeah, well, well was at first. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, right. the general admission waved waved oh. pushed me back a little bit as it as the night went on, right? Yeah, which was thing back then once the wave if a wave came you just rode the wave you couldn't you couldn't fight the wave yeah. you know these brute force of people moving you're going to move you know it, I, I was standing there at the rail with uh, i went with a couple of friends and uh girls with kathy she was in front of me and i was holding the rail just to keep all these people from moving us and it, it comes to a point where you're just not strong enough to prevent that but right. for a few songs on the front row so well, and so the, the beginning of the show, then, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so Unchained was the first song, and D David Lee Roth comes flying off the riser. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, at, at the US Festival, you hear Eddie's guitar, and it's like yeah. Ruben described, filling that whole outdoor amphitheater. But then in '84, when you hear his guitar, it's like right there, 
loud, super loud, just incredibly loud. Right. And uh, that that's my biggest recollection from the Birmingham show in 84 was just how incredibly loud it was. Right, right. You know, the the that show you and I were at July, January 31st, 84. 82, 84 was the first time. And, and, you know, of course, I watched the Us Festival, and that was kind of like a catalyst for me to be at that show. And, you know, Kurt, you know, this is a funny thing, Ruben, is that Kurt and I grew up in, we're in Alabama, of course. And what was weird about the year before 84, right after you guys had been at the Us Festival, we had, if I'm not right on this, Kurt, Correct me, but we had an ice storm in the winter. Oh, was there 93? No, wait a minute. I'm thinking were, about 93. There were a few of them. There's a snowstorm in 93 where we had like two foot of snow, but there was also an ice storm that happened. And we, the reason I'm thinking of this is because the tickets for 84 went on sale while we were in that situation. You don't remember <laughs> that? Well, anyway, for some reason it sticks out in my head because I was stuck with my parents and we were listening to the radio because that's the only thing you could do in an ice storm. Right. And um, yeah, and so that that of course the thing was it was announced really close to the end of the year for us, which meant it was only thirty something days away before right. we would see this see them. And it wasn't like some long drawn out eight months before they told us they were going to be in town. It was like literally like thirty days or maybe forty. And uh, and then we were there, man. And and I, when I think about that eighty four show, I always think about that shot in the Panama video on the right side, looking down on the stage and Roth is running across. That yeah. was kind of like where I was sitting that night, right side, any side uh, up a little bit. And uh, so it always seems to me like that's Birmingham. That was our show. That was our show. It's not our show for, <laughs> for sure, but, but it was just, it just always triggers that memory. Like that's where I was at that moment. Yeah. So, yeah, man, I can't believe the us festival that, the, how long that's, you know, 40 years now. Can you guys believe that? That's insane. I mean, okay. it's like a lifetime ago, but also the same time like yesterday, you know, 83. It's, it's like, I can't believe it's 40 years ago, but um, that memory is like ingrained in my head, you know. Uh, you know, it, for me, it was like the best concert on like the worst day <laughs> at the same time because of the, the heat and getting sunburn and the whole thing about walking you know down the freeway to, from the campsite to the to the us festival and then even after the fact after you know after the concert was over uh trying to get back home was a was an ordeal too because there's no cell phones so right um, yeah yeah it, it was a uh, it was interesting how i my parents finally were able to find us <laughs> right how did that, a lot of that this is a crazy stuff that used to happen back then how you'd get around and how you didn't have any kind of phone and you have yeah to, you had to find one right so and kurt and i actually experienced this heat again at the the, the 88 show in the memphis liberty bowl right remember how hot it was yeah oh my god Monster. monsters of rock yeah and you know again scorpions is right you know in front of them and scorpions again just were super tight and um i was so hot and wore out i didn't make it through van halen i mean dude i had been didn't sleep the night before and then uh you know we started early like the us festival and it was blazing hot and then they had the massive cup fight thing remember that People will talk about that online. I see people say that whenever they're talking about the Memphis show, they'll talk about the big cup fight. The entire stadium started throwing cups up and down <laughs> and everywhere all at once. It was the most insane <laughs> thing I've ever seen. But it was also the biggest one show outdoor only, I think the only uh, stadium show that I've been to, actually. And uh, it was amazing. It was amazing. And Van Allen was great. It wasn't that. I was just so damn tired. I just remember Van Halen. We uh, we moved around a, a bit when we watched Metallica. We were, you know, up in the in the upper part, uh, and I kept saying, "I've got to get, you know, in a good spot to hear Van Halen." So we ended up on the opposite end, but very first, you know, first level of seats, the very first level, mm -hmm. behind mm -hmm. the soundboard. Yeah, uh, just Van right. Halen sounded massive. Just what, the volume seemed louder. Everything seemed clearer, but it was probably the best spot to hear them for that show. Right. I was, just gonna say, I was, I was in the same spot. I backed, I went up to the back of the stadium directly behind the soundboard, 
uh, like you said, fairly medium low. And man, the Scorpions before them, it sounded like the record, man. It was it was really a great mix. And I was like, wow, it was it was something amazing. Yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't right. get to go to the 84 concert, uh, but I've seen a lot of, you know, videos on YouTube and heard a lot of bootlegs. Um, but I will say this, and, and you guys were there and you experienced it live and, you know, we're all guitar players here. But sure. for me, that Eddie's Spotlight solo on the 1984 tour, it, you know, for me, it's got to be my all time favorite, just as far as what he did, uh, especially when, you know, they had that little chunk where they're doing that blues jam and Edward just improving, just just because his, his tone, his feel, just everything, you know, he's backing off on the volume and and it's just killing it. And then the other moment when he does the, the TV tray thing and mm -hmm. then the, the trusses come down and then he's playing it, it's just so, it's just beautiful. For me, that's like the all-time favorite Eddie Van Halen Spotlight solo was 1984. I wish I could have been there to see it because every time I hear that and see that, I'm like, oh, man, that's just it's like perfect, you know? Because yeah. I mean, because uh, kind of after that, it kind of turned into like a greatest hits thing. You know, you got Eruption, you got Cathedral, you got Spanish Fly, sure. um, and all that. But I, that when he did the blues thing, and then you know the, the piano thing, uh, um, just just amazing. Yeah, and, and then something about that tone. I think on that tour was a, a very different for like the, I don't know what it's almost like, not like he's using a different amp, but the tone is just so, I don't even know how to describe it. It's just the, like a wicked, wicked, huge um, killer sound. I mean, he always had a great tone, but something about that tone in 84, it's, it's more of a power sound. It's like not very gainy. I mean, not, it, it even sounds not as, dirty as like the previous year like at the us festival it's just a, a big clean power sound and it's just amazing and uh, one thing us festival and maybe their own access at you know all these guys even the peer how does eddie man healing get that sound back then you know you know there's not you know yeah he did interviews and stuff but still um is still a mystery, you know. Even today, people really don't, you know, we have a really good idea. We use, I get that. Still, there's a couple pieces of puzzle that Eddie never, who knows. I just know the 84 tone for me. Every time I hear that, I'm like, man, that is, that is one of the biggest, cleanest power guitar sounds I've ever heard, you know, Edward. So they, uh, Kurt, you know, you know, you since you build amps, and Kurt, I didn't say this earlier, but Kurt Granger amplification's been around for a long time, and and uh, you were actually, I think, Kurt, I, I think far, I believe far before Frieden was doing any kind of these kind of boutiquey plexis, you were doing this years and years ago. How long ago did that start? That was probably uh, two thousand seven. Hey, 2008 when I, the first M50 flight and it was definitely uh, based on the 80s early early sound uh, but you know as Ruben said in 84 it did sound just really just raw and, and refined at the same time but to me it almost sounded like just I, I cranked up JCM 800 and I read that he used some 800s along the way on tour. So who knows, you know, what he had that night or what was in his, you know, three or four heads sitting there all idle, ready to go and two blows in one tech plugs into the other, who knows, you know, but it, it, it's definitely the best sounding Van Halen show I've been to in 84. And yeah. like I said, I've seen them 16 times and always sounded great, but that there's something about being in front row and you just hearing that guitar to amp, just at that volume, it just does something. It's just, it's a magical moment, you know, at that whole show. I was, I was fortunate. I took my dad's camera and got some really good shots of Eddie during his solo spot with the, with the lighting and all that from the trust and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he played little guitars with the little, little Les Paul, and that was really cool. And, uh, of course, you know, highlight for me was also when, when they did what I'll Wait. And uh, Eddie and, and, and Michael were both on the tiers playing keyboards and it was just David Lee Roth by himself doing the, uh, the whole karate with the, the sword and all that. 
which is just when you think about the entertainment value of that, it's just you don't see a lot of bands doing things like that, especially no, then. You know, no, I remember that in particular because he did he played jump as well on on the tier with Mike, and then played the guitar solo with the right. keyboard instead, and and that was you know unique. For, for, you know, I think you know we think about Cradle of Rock in '80, which we none of us went to, but Damon went to our friend from the second episode of this series, and. um you know, and and let he played the Les Paul that we all know the 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 vintage Les Paul, a sunburst on that, and then Mike played the bass like he kind of did on, you know, when you watch the thing from Downington, you see them both playing the keyboards like they did on the tears, but they were doing them on the ground, you know, which was cool. So, yeah, yeah, that was a, it was an amazing amazing thing. Yeah, the eighty. 80- 84 was a very together show and it, and it was their kind of their peak, but people always go, you know, that, that, you know, Noel Monk, their manager said they were kind of coming apart at the seams at that point, you know, inside the band anyway. And uh, I don't know that. Yeah. You, uh, still- you, you got to give some credit to. Go ahead. I was going to say, you got to give a lot of credit to Pete Angelis who designed all the lighting and staging for all that. You know, back then he was still cohorts with David Lee Roth and a lot of those, pro- they probably you know, sprung ideas off each other to develop all that. But the fair warning tour and the 84 tour, those stages and the lighting on that were just incredible. You know, yeah, so. I was just telling uh, my friend, John, that we grew up with uh, from the span 4am that I, that I grew up along alongside. We were talking about uh, Pete because uh, Pete ended up being the manager for um, black crows after all that happened. But back in the day, Pete was dating Tony McCann, Tony, Katane and Tawny was there for all the eighties stuff, but you know, Pete's story is, is an amazing story and I want to get him on here, but I'm going to tell you this little story about Pete <laughs> because Pete was the light guy at the whiskey. And I, Ruben probably knows this story because this is so, you know, out there and everything, but uh, Pete was the, the light guy and Van Halen came in. And I, if I, if I misstate this, somebody put it in the comments because I, you know, I could, could mix it up. But as far as I remember, Pete had an article where he wrote this all out and uh, I have a copy of it, but basically started out as this, the lighting guy at the whiskey. He didn't know Van Halen. Van Halen came in and over the talk back as, as they finished, he goes over the talk back, you guys suck, you know, <laughs> effing, effing suck or whatever. And he got fired at the whiskey that night because of it. But David Lee Roth <laughs> loved it so much. He started hanging out with Pete and Pete ended up getting the job with Van Halen. And that's, wow, I never that's, that's how their, that's how their, their whole story came together. And Pete ended up going on that, that big tour and, you know, all those tours. And he was, you know, I, I Roth takes a lot of credit for it, but uh, you know, we, we know Pete was, you know, he was one of the Picasso brothers, right? I mean, he was like Dave's right hand. Oh, yeah. man. And, uh, you know, and I think Pete's even spiked up saying here and there that maybe he didn't get as much credit as he probably should have. But, but yeah, those, those, the looks, the whole, you know, they, how they would transition those cabinets that they use from flag systems to change the look of them every year. They obviously the same cabinets are moving around, you know, from 81. They, uh, the, I think these cabinets in 80 were different ones. Um, but the ones from 81 on, I think were or through the us festival were probably all the same cabinets just refaced or whatever, as far as I yeah. know. But um in 80, now those 80 cabinets, one of those or uh, maybe all of those 80 cabinets went to Jackal. Really? Yeah, and they still have parts of them anyway. Hmm. I, I saw a video not long ago. Somebody wanted somebody posted a video on, I think it was on Instagram, touring their stage. And when they walk by, somebody goes, You know what these are? And you can see the Van Halen logos on the back of those cabins from 80. Nice. Yeah. yeah. So they're still out there. And I've had people approach me that say they have some and they'd like to sell them, but I haven't been able to, <laughs> I haven't been able to, <laughs> haven't been able to officially see one in person yet, but I would love to have one of the 81 cabins. If anybody out there got any, <laughs> but I don't think I, I probably, probably can't afford it, but, <laughs> but it'd be awesome to have a piece of history like that. <laughs> yeah those cabinets you know one of my buddies that was on here he said that in 81 the way that pete lit those uh before they came out on stage he said it was kind of like a bluish purple and all of that white facing on those cabinets glowed in the dark 
you know, and the whole, that whole mountain of speakers was glowing like in a purple color. And he said, it was just, just like you guys were talking about with the US Festival. There's just that anticipation as they were coming out, you know, Eddie has this classic thing where he starts tapping and all the drums come in and it's this, you know, this are typical thing they do. And, uh, but, you know, one of the other stylistic things that, that they do were the endings, you know, uh, we would see this echoed through bands like Scorpions and, and all these other bands, how they would make these big endings, like the Hot for Teacher ending is the one that always comes to mind to me. But I, there was a lot of echoing going on in the bands around them. You know, you'd see the Van Halen influence across the guitar players. And, you know, who was the first guitar player, Kurt, you saw that you said, hey, these kind of like Eddie Van Halen? Oh, uh, probably Vito. Vito Rodham. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ruben, what about you? Yeah, actually, that you take the words right out of my mouth. You know, when, when I when I saw Vito, I heard him Stratocaster, even his hair, you know, the long kind of like Van Halen two hair, and right, right, and the capping, you know, um, he was, you know, the closest, you know, I, I would compare to Eddie Van Halen, you know, and like Eddie Van Halen and that melodic sense of Randy Rhodes in there, you know, like a yeah. good, you know, hybrid of the two. Yeah, when I was at when I first discovered Van Halen through that first video on Unchained, I think you know I think I really keyed in on the sound so much right off the bat, probably because it was drop D and I really hadn't ever heard it drop D and that kind of tone together. Uh, I probably heard drop D with Fat Bottom Girls or something prior, but but uh, then I flipped on MTV and I heard George Lynch on Breaking the Chains and I I went that the martial tone, you know, that thing just, I was like, that's another, that's, that's kind of the thing, you know, that's the sound. That's where it comes from. And I kind of keyed in on the old martial sound right away. Like that is part of the DNA of Eddie's thing. And that's kind of where I went with, you know, my first guy that I kind of like went, Oh, there's another guy. Like there's gotta be other guys like this guy. Right. You know, other than Ace Freely, you know, cause Kurt and I, of course, we've talked about Ace a lot and, um, you know, how much he influenced all of us, I guess, probably you too, Ruben, maybe. Ace Freely? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, to me, Ace was like, like Jimmy Page, another level, like Jimmy Page from Outer Space, you know, the Les Paul and just that that blues bass, you know. But, but to me, Ace in the entire band, his, he, to me, he was the rock star. Ace was like, my guy and kids i'm not a super huge kiss fan but um i've always loved ace just everything about it and and i have a friend of mine we were talking about this years ago about what defines a guitar hero right um and when you think to me and in my friend we agreed 100 percent. you know had the exact same opinion of what kind of defines a guitar hero number one you know of course you have to be a, a great player like yeah. eddie van halen Mm -hmm. uh, great player um number two tone you know because you, you can't you have to have a good tone i mean you can't play great and then have a tone that you just can't hear and you don't want to hear it sure. um but number three because of the word hero you know we said th there has to be something different and, and for lack of a better word like a fashion sense because like eddie van halen and not only, you know, you put on the Van Halen one and you hear the tone, you hear the plane, you hear the notes, you hear everything. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the record and you see how this guy looks, you know, that disco shirt open and then the guitar stripe in his mouth. And then the second record, the same thing on the back, you know, the same kind of clothes, the red pants or whatever, and the yellow and black, the bumblebee. And then you get into Van Halen 3 where he's wearing the jumpsuit like he's you know parachuting out of out of the sky <laughs> you know fair warning you know he's wearing these like baseball pant things and and right. there's just something about that i mean where you had yeah, yeah you, there's eddie van halen then you say you have a guy like next to eddie van halen that probably plays just the same same tone or whatever but he's just in a t-shirt and jeans like who's gonna be the guitar hero to me I'm like that guy's the hero because he's like larger than life there's something about this so, so to me that that's kind of like ace freely where like yeah he's a spaceman you know he's playing a guitar this fire came out out of the neck and all that stuff so to me that that kind of defines a guitar hero where you know yeah you're a great player but there's just that one extra thing that completes that package to 
to make you a hero, you know, and not knocking Slash, he's an amazing player, but, you know, I know that people call him a hero, but, you know, to me, a hero has to have that extra flair or something about it, you know, that just pushes it over the top. And, and A.D. Van Halen was that, man, because, you know, looking at the picture behind you right there, uh, Jeff, yeah, you know, right, right. That's that that's a hero, right? There. <laughs> that's a guitar right. hero. 79, and that's Memphis actually behind me. That my uh, buddy that uh, actually gives me all pr- the permission to use his photographs to, from his shows at uh, 79, 78, also in, in Memphis at the Mid South Coliseum. Um, you know, just amazing. Yeah, you, the, the visual uh, thing with Eddie first of all his smile and the way that he looked like he always loved what he was doing and and then you know obviously his moves were beautiful he you know he had like a beautiful movement to him and um you know the superhero thing like ace you know he had that and then he had so many of those things that kind of like would echo off these other guitar players that we we talked about earlier you know they this this whole the looks would they would you know they would tweak them to their thing george's was the was the the tiger guitar you know and then you'd see other graphic guitars that kept coming out and that was like a whole thing that besides the super strat you know obviously behind me uh that he, he pioneered there was all these different things that i don't think people realize how many um things that he small things that he created that people carried with them that we that we knew about but didn't carry on 20 years later people don't really realize that you know that maybe a shirt or a shoe or a, <laughs> i mean i would i would see that striped shirt now i know it's probably of the era the striped uh red and white raggedy ann shirt or whatever that was you know some people call it waldo but you would see that that was uh the guy from triumph uh, gill the drummer was wearing one that night at, at us festival a black one same, same pattern oh, yeah yeah same thing but uh, you would see that style. So maybe that was more of a style thing. But for him, it became this, like, I mean, people were coming up to me when I was doing the tribute, you know, wearing that outfit, that, saying, where's Waldo? You're where's Wal- you're Waldo. And I was thinking, <laughs> I don't know if it, that was what he was thinking, you know, whether he was thinking about it. Because Waldo becomes a character in the 84, you know, uh, Pop oh. or Teacher video, right? But I don't know that that outfit was meant to be emulating Waldo. I think it was just stylistic, just van halen mashup or whatever like they did but but it was funny that somebody said that and then i went back to Slozauer, who was there and i said did they, did they ever and he he was like what <laughs> waldo i'm like you know they say where's waldo you know and then he didn't really know about the books and i didn't know about them that much myself because you know, as a kid i didn't really see that but but later when i looked at it i kind of got it you know because the people do dress up as this but but it's weird where they may have pulled these ideas from you know whether they just it's almost like they never planned anything. Like he said, we never plan anything. You know, we didn't plan this. So like they just grab stuff, the, the, the reflectors on the back of his guitar, you know, just grabs them at a truck stop, throws them on the back, turns into an iconic thing, you know, paints a guitar. Everybody paints a guitar. <laughs> just, just crazy stuff like that. It's amazing, man. Well, uh, yeah, any other- so many Huh? Yeah. Just the things that he influenced from whether it's gear, whether it's dress or clothing, whether it's your demeanor on stage, just so many ways. He was such an influence to our generation of guitar players. And it's like, you know, the poster you got on the wall behind you, I mean, that is larger than life. I mean, I mean, it is, you know, it's like one thing that's lacking now is is people forget that in addition to being a great musician, you need to be an entertainer. You know, we want to be entertained. Audiences want to be entertained. Sure. However you do it, it can be great technique. It can be great tone. It can be your moves on stage. It can be the whole package of the band, but Van Halen understood entertainment. That's why they were so larger than life. I mean, when I went to 84 and I went to see Eddie. You know, every guitar player who's who's starting goes to see Eddie Van Halen. But Eddie Van Halen has your attention for about 10 seconds, but you can't help turn and look at Ross. And it's like, okay, I want to look at Eddie, but here's Ross. Oh, there's Alex, you know. The whole the whole band just had that. You want to look at him. You want to stare at him. You want to see what they're doing because they were so entertaining. The whole two hours or whatever it was they were performing, it was just 
the total package for entertainment at that time. I mean, it really was. For sure. Well, how do you feel about that, Ruben? I mean, about that. Yeah, you know, yeah, Van Halen, and and I think you know that just comes from all the years playing. They, they just had that live, you know, thing down, and and I think, um, I think when they got signed. I'm I'm just assuming like uh, Warner Brothers probably figured okay yeah they, these guys sound good live how are they going to sound in the studio are we going to have to do this and that to make it sound good are we going to have to get other guys to you know ghost players or whatever but you know these guys being so experienced at their live thing to come in and just knock it out on the record but then okay let's take these guys out on tour and to go and you know, do these gigs opening for Montrose or Journey, whatever, and to basically, you know, steal that show. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they how old were they when they came out on that first show? They were babies, you know, and then right, right, to right. have that to have that um, maturity that like they're on stage, like they've been playing for over twenty years, and they are twenty years old, you know, just to have that and it, just to knock it out um, and have that confidence and have that. Um, that that way where it's like they're not scared they're in front of a stadium like okay you know we play backyard we play clubs but you know whenever they played a backyard party whenever they played a club they nothing changed as far as their show played the only thing that changed was the amount of people they were playing in front of um that's, so that's they, they always had that yeah that, that that's, that's the only thing that's the thing that people that saw them back in the in the early days that i talked to that backyard parties <laughs> they said exactly what you just said the only difference between seeing them in the backyard party and seeing them at the forum was that it was just a bigger room <laughs> they were no different he said we saw exactly the same thing back in a backyard party you know just a few years before they were at the forum and he said they yeah. were they were always like that you know and they're like you said though like with 80 with 84 down engine footage that popped up um because they were kind of uh in a in a festival setting where they didn't have their normal routine you you saw the kind of club mentality of like we're just going to go out here and kick ass and you know there's going to be a lot of off the cuff on this thing you know that's what you were just saying yeah i I remember in the 07 when they did the reunion tour my wife had never seen van halen with david lee ross she's always been a you know a van hagar fan you know van halen fan with sammy hagar um so you know i had one ticket to the uh, radio station down here called KLOS, and i did this little skit thing to win tickets to the concert and i got a couple of tickets but you know a lot of times when you win these tickets on a concert on, on a radio station they're not the best seats mm-hmm. so my, my wife's like you know we're gonna get this is the first time i'm seeing with david Lewis. we're gonna get some good seats so we got good seats and then we gave it my tickets that i won to our oldest daughter and a friend of of hers and they went and they sat you know in the nosebleed and we had the good seats but it was funny when we got into the it was the staples center here in la and we walk into the to the arena and we're sitting down and chandra's like looking around and first thing she notices even the crowd was different she's like these these are different even the people here are different than the sammy hagar crowd because Sammy Hagar is like more loose beach, you know, people, sandals, flip flops, and stuff like that. And these people look like, you know, they're from the streets of LA. Like it's just a very different vibe. And then, you know, while we're waiting, these little blimps come out. They're like flying right. around the arena. Right. And she's like, What's that? And I go, That's David Lee Roth. I go, This is all Roth stuff. I go, You just wait and see. Right. So the, the lights drop, the band comes out, and it's that like the us festival it's that big wham bag spotlights trolling everywhere eddie van halen screaming and tapping and alex you know thundering drums and my wife looks over at me and she's like oh my god what's gonna happen (laughs) she was like blown away i go and i just said this yeah i love van halen with sammy hagar and i'll tell you right now the the carnal knowledge years 91 to 93 for me that's like my favorite van halen era regardless of who's singing but right. when she looked at me and and had this like look of like awe and fear and asked me like what's going on i said this 
is the real Van Halen. And then when she when they came out and David Lee Roth did his thing and his jump and he came out with this big giant flag and and then at the end would jump and all the, the you know the confetti and everything, she was blown away. She's like, now I get it. And I go, yeah, you know, this this, this is the Van Halen that right. you know, put them on the map. And then after the show, you know, we're walking away and then we meet up with my, my, our oldest daughter and her friend. And they're like, you know, this is 07. So Heather's probably like in her early twenties and their friends. So they were like in the early twenties. They've never gone to like a concert like this. Okay. So I, I look at Heather. I'm like, so, so what do you think? And she's like, I've never been to anything like this in my life it was amazing i go this is how concerts were when we were kids this is this is was the norm this is everything about a concert back then was a fun great time you got entertained and um but yeah i'll, I'll never forget you know sandra saying they were off for the first time and and being blown away how different the band was you know from that entertainment factor i mean they they were they were great entertainers you know with sammy hagar but that a David Lee Roth element, you know, you know, what like a lot of people say, without Roth there would be no Edward. Without Edward, there would be no Roth. You know, Edward was the musician, the songwriter, the 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 guitar hero, and Roth was the salesman. Not only that, I mean, you know, Roth is the only guy that could come up with vocals and lyrics and vocal phrasings over edge drifts you know who, who, that's like one of the hardest jobs to do right. you know to hear right. edward play any of those riffs and really to come up with vocals for that and you know, amazing vocals and great lyrics and song titles you know that 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 is amazing in itself yeah when you listen to the you know with all the uh tracks that are being dropped with the isolated tracks and you really you start to go you know how would i have sang over that break and unchanged you know the <laughs> You know the whole blue blue eyed murder, whatever the blue eyed murder, whatever is he says in that and unchanged. You know, it's just how would you drop those melodies into that spot? So, I mean, it just doesn't. Most people just wouldn't be able to do that. And I think when you when you heard Gary, and I don't know how much of that was Edward and how much that was Gary on Van Halen Three, but I felt like that was kind of like the weakness was like if you would have put Roth on three, he would have figured out a way to make those songs. He would have made a song out of those songs that Eddie had. That would have been much more appealing to everyone. Like you did with, you know, those two songs that he did on the uh, little best of that came out, you know, that were still really different and further down the road for Edward musically, but still it was the Roth thing, you know? Yeah. When, when I heard that, um, on the different kind of truth, the blood and fire, you know, that's originally that Ripley tune, that instrumental that Edward wrote. Mm -hmm. And to hear like Roth actually put words over that, it was kind of, I was like, wow, this is that song. And there's a, it's a complete song. You now there's, there's singing and vocals over it. And, and to do what he did over it, you know, cause there's some odd meter stuff in the song too. And, and that's one thing like David Roth, it's like, no matter what the band was doing underneath, like unchained that pre-chorus, you know, the thought you'd never miss me till I got a fat city, all that, mm -hmm. you know, to sing those lines while that's happening under, you know, and to make it so seamless and so natural. And, uh, the, yeah, Ross is just amazing. It's so damn cool. I mean, how cool, <laughs> yeah. uh, how cool are all those little breaks where he would throw in a one liner, you know, that we, we remember forever, you know, have you seen juniors grades one break coming up? I mean, there's, they're just all over these records and, I always thought that was cool when I was growing up because I kept, okay, oh, what's Eddie going to do? What's the next, you know, little musical piece we're going to hear? And what Rothisms are we going to have? You know, <laughs> we knew they were coming. And those guys just had a thing to do that. You know, they had these these little pieces and parts that they would do that were always kind of like similar, but it would be always mixed up in some way that seemed totally new. I mean, you know, even though we knew it was like a pattern with them they were able to do this crazy stuff what do you think kurt no oh, i agree i agree you know um regarding roth you know he he was just larger than life and just the ultimate front man entertainer you know when if you've never seen the uh the henry rollins clip where he's doing the the bit about van halen that's a that's a definite for any van halen fan and he doesn't you know hagar was great and he's a great songwriter great with van halen but 
Henry Rollins doesn't do Hagar. He does Roth. He does a great impersonation of Roth. And, uh, you know, he, he, he nails him. But, you know, it was David Lee Roth. You know, you know, he's talking about all those vocal phrases that he came up with. It's just incredible. And uh, definitely one of the strengths of that era of Van Halen and, and, and the whole, you know, the whole package, it was Van Halen, you know, Eddie, Eddie has these killer lead riffs and, and Ross right there with him with the, with the vocal phrasing. And it's just a, it's, it was an incredible thing. Yeah. There was a thing where it was Paul Gilbert talking about, he was breaking down um, beautiful girls. I think Van Halen too, or somebody was, and they were talking about how Roth would do, it was like at the end, you know, when they're doing that whole ride out and, and beautiful girls and Eddie's, it seems like every lick he does, there's 25 different ones. Like if you've ever tried yeah. to learn it, it's like, <laughs> there's no pattern to this. It they're playing so, live. <laughs> it's so hard to remember it. Like if you were to try to memorize every little lick on that ride out, there's 25 different things. But it's like as a response to Ross, whatever Ross little mm. lick is, you know, he'll do a different lick and then Eddie will do a different lick and they'll answer each yeah. other. And and it was kind of that interplay that that you would hear all through, you know, the records that not as you know, that's not subtle, but other ones are more subtle. But they're they were always like kind of like call and answer, even though it never felt like call and answer you know like they did do hardcore call and answer when they did those things on stage you know they would he would sing and eddie would play to it and that kind of thing call and answer but it within the songs there were call and answers that that eddie was doing in a subtle way that was really cool what do you think kirk oh i agree i agree totally you know fools off women and children first is another one where they do the bit at the beginning and it's it's also subtle and low-key but then boom you know here's the rest of the song and that's always been a great appeal to me for van halen's the way they're able to just go from here to here and here and just constantly you know doing something to grab your attention back and forth it's not just straight you know by the end of the record you're tired of hearing it it's like up and down up and down all over the place and just constantly you're drawn to what's going to happen next what are they going to sing what are they going to say next you know it's always been that way all those roth albums so Kirk, give me the song, man. The the one song that for all I know you can't, it's hard to do, but one song <laughs> that's Van Halen for you, man. Man. Oh two. give me two. Give me, give me give me two. Give me two. Two. <laughs> <laughs> the ones that just you just get like they, for some reason you just really keyed in on. Uh Unchained. I mean, Unchained is is, is it was my ringtone for a long time. Uh and the second one, Lord, I don't know. Uh, probably drop dead legs. All right, I, I remember you yeah. play, you played that over here, on, and I actually put it on. It's on, great riff. It's on the channel, and you were playing that with one of my guitars. Remember that? And it, shout out to uh, shout out to Wolf for bringing that back into the set for the last right. tour because the last I never tour. Got it live, and I got to see it. That was my last Van Halen show, and they're doing drop dead legs finally. All right, Ruben, two, maybe yeah. two, two. <laughs> You can you can give me two. You can give me one, Sammy, and one uh, Eddie, or, or I mean, not Sammy, Sammy or Roth, or whatever you want to do. Well, I mean, it, it's about Edward for me. All about you know Edward. That's been it from the beginning. You, you know, you got Roth, you got Hagar, but the guy is responsible for all that is Eddie Van Halen. Mm -hmm. um, so the era doesn't matter. But for the longest time, the Van Halen one and Fair Warning were my two records. Mm -hmm. But now if it's been fair warning and um 84 because there's something about 84 just that the sound you know that 16 inch tape 16 inch track two inch tape is just all that headroom it just sounds really good mm -hmm. so for me two songs it has to be something off 84 and i would go say with girl gone bad they're just something really progressive and really like different you know that that whole record there's like a, a maturity level um you know, with the songwriting and with Edwards playing. And um, then I would have to go, man, fair warning for me, the guitar solo and even the song, One Foot Out the Door. Really? Uh, that just sounds like a soundtrack to a, a movie. Like whenever I hear this, I just think of like cars racing and that solo at the end. It's oh, just yeah. uh, it's amazing. Great. You know, and then the, the little bit of that harmonizer on the solo. So just like, you know, just 
that that tongue to the next level and there's like a piece or two in that solo where it does like this weird chromatic thing and yeah. it almost just whenever i hear it it just sounds like notes are falling off the fretboard whenever i hear that i'm like what is that um so uh, you know i'll say that one foot out the door and girl gone bad that, that, that right, would well, be it for me. yeah i'd have to go fair warning uh you know obviously unchained was the first song i ever heard and it just changed my life so you know and i it's really this this is really hard because uh i loved um uh van halen too out out, uh, out of love of course is such a freaking that solo in, in particular because it's so different no tapping just insane but uh for me you really got me and unchained that the for me that freaking riff and you really got me the beginning the tone is just yeah you know, i just turn I, I swear to god last night i was in the car and i just moved the balance all to the side to where the guitar was just to hear that raw as i could because i just i'm obsessed with that sound man and it, we all were and still are probably <laughs> kurt's been building amps that, that that do that you know it's it's an amazing uh, thing with the, all of that how that happened but yeah those are amazing songs amazing tones man you know you guys kind of over the us festival thing Kurt, give me a just kind of a, a closing statement about your experience that day and and how you've kind of over the years you know absorbed that and i mean obviously we talked about all the little intricacies of van halen but that particular day you know, what, if you could summarize it in a in a short well, jeff you know that's the, it was the adventure of my lifetime. It really was. I've never done anything before or since that equaled that. Just the whole, not just the, the day at the show, but, but the whole trip out there. You know, as a 17 year old, this is the first time I'd gone further to the Mississippi on my own uh, with my best friend, Jeff. And we had car trouble in Mississippi. My alternator went out. It was the exit that my Aunt Elaine lived on. We walked two miles to her house, woke her up at three o'clock in the morning, you know, wow. that kind of thing. We got out to Texas, you know, I still haven't told my dad we're going. So I call him from a payphone and says, Hey dad, I'm in Texas, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then driving, driving a whole day through Texas. You don't realize how large Texas is until you have to drive across it. Right. Uh, desert through Arizona. And we were stripped down to next to nothing underwear and t-shirt. It was so hot, no AC. You get out to California. The first night we get out there, we get lost. We're in some subdivision. We run out of gas, so we're walking in a subdivision. Don't don't know where we are, and a sheriff deputy pulls up and said, "Are you are you guys lost?" And it's like, "Yes, man, we ran out of gas." She says, "You're not from around here, right?" <laughs> 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 what the accent give it away? Uh, right. uh, you know the whole the whole adventure out there, and then the whole spectacle of it all. The day at the festival was just hugely incredible all the people never been around that many people before or since in my whole entire life it was just it's something you you will you will never forget you know and i've since told the story i, I did a a speech in in college for uh you know public speaking pick a topic and do a speech on it you know this is what i did you know i did the, my story of this festival wow. so it made a, a lifelong impression you know and i'll never forget it that's amazing, man. Yeah, it sounds like, you know, because Ruben and I had this discussion before, and I know a little bit more about his story to the US Festival. It sounds like a very similar uh, bunch of circumstances that that had you all jacked up too, Ruben, getting getting there, coming home, the whole nine yards. Kind of give me uh, your little piece on that, on the whole thing. Yeah, it, it was uh, the same thing. I mean, the, the immediate, like, response when everybody asked me about the US Festival – it's like, like I said earlier, I believe I said this, like the, the best concert and the worst day. <laughs> yeah, all right, in one. Right. It was just amazing to see all those bands, but then the, the heat, you know, um, and just the, the things surrounding it, you know, like the, the things getting to the concert. And then the, uh, Kurt talking about the sheriff finding you guys lost, like when we were leaving, after the concert, we, me and my little brother, we were lost. We were like walking along the 10 freeway and it was pitch black and nobody was there. And a, a sheriff comes up to us and it was a different, different type of experience. It was like, this guy was not friendly. <laughs> he, saw, he saw my Iron Maiden t-shirt. I don't know what t-shirt my brother's wearing, but he now. thought we were like, he thought we were like drugged out Satan or something. And 
he just started like ripping into us and um then my little brother started giving him attitude back and and I, I told Jim, I go, dude, mellow out. We are out here. There's nobody around here. There's just us and him. He can do whatever he wants with us. So I told Jimmy, just shut up. Just be quiet. And then this cop said, he's like, all right, I'm going to call you guys a cab. Mm. Just stay right here. And then the cab will come and, you know, take wherever you need to go. Cab never showed up. He never called anybody. So, we, you know, we ended up sleeping on the front steps of a CHP station with that, our little blanket and then the next morning we walked over to a, a, a coffee shop got on a pay phone and called my parents and they actually had we luckily we caught them back at home but they had actually had been going back and forth that night looking for us you know they had gone to san bernardino went back gone back um so yeah it, it was it was an amazing experience. The concert was just awesome, but <laughs> everything that surrounded <laughs> that was just not, you know. All right. And we got badly sunburned too. We we didn't put any take any sunblock, so we were like beyond sunburned, you know. Um, but I would not do it again. I, I think no, I would do it again. I, I would do it again, knowing okay, if I knew the temperature, if I knew what to experience, you know, elements wise, I would have gone better prepared because we didn't take any water. You know, we'd walk back up to the top and luckily we had that water cash my dad gave me. We were like buying water all day long, just, you know, whatever it caused here. Yeah, sure. Um, but right. we just were not prepared. We, we, we didn't know what to expect. I'm sure right. a lot of people didn't know what to expect. Right. Well, you, it's like Woodstock and who to expect in Woodstock, right? I guess the whole thing was such a, just like this event, you know, it, it it so exceeded what I think Wozniak had. A, I mean, <laughs> he wanted to have this party and it turned out to be this it, it, second Woodstock. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a crazy story before we wrap up. I want to uh, do this thing work with Kurt because, because Ruben, Ruben had the rare opportunity to play through Eddie's gear um when it was stored right tell tell kurt your story and tell that story a little bit so kurt and you could have this amp talk <laughs> oh yeah yeah um well years ago i was in a, a randy rose tribute band in la i think we were the very first randy rose tribute band that you know formed in la back in the early 90s we'd only play on the anniversary of randy rose's death it's not like a thing we did throughout the year to make money it's just as a real tribute to randy because my, my bass player he actually took lessons from randy rose um a couple of lessons before he went off to to join ozzy um so this bass player friend of mine he, he was he was a guitar player but he played bass in this randy rose tribute and he was um really good friends with chris holmes and this is probably like 1992 or 93 and you know we know the friendship the, of Eddie Van Halen and Chris Holmes. So uh, Eddie Van Halen gave Chris, you know, some of his amps. I don't know what, what tour it was, but he would do a tour, and you know, he just gave Chris these cabs and, and these Marshalls. And um, this was the era or the period where Chris Holmes was married well, to Lita Ford, but actually they were kind of on their way to being unmarried. I think Lita Ford had kicked Chris Holmes out of the house and <laughs> Chris Holmes needed a place to store his gear. So he, he told my friend, Michael, he's like, Hey, can I just leave my, my stuff, you know, in your garage? And Michael's like, yeah, of course you can. Sure. <laughs> um, so Michael called me up. He's like, Hey, Ruben. I'm like, yeah. He's like, I got Chris's gear here. He's like, this is Eddie Van Halen gave him these amps. These are Edwards amps. You got to come down here. And I'm like, Okay, I just hung up the phone. I had like a little warm with, you know, a strat that I made, warm with body, warm with neck. I just threw it in the back of my truck and I raced down to Burbank, which is where my friend Michael lived. And then we go into the garage and there's like these two Marshall stacks and there's like a rack. And um, I don't know if this is how Edward had mounted the Variac or if Chris did this, but in the rack, there was just like a big flat panel and the, the, the knob was kind of, you know, uh, mounted on the outside, the knob for the Variac, so you can, you know, uh, turn the voltage down. And Michael's like, don't touch anything. Let's just turn everything on. Don't fiddle with any knob, nothing. Or, you know, you'll know that somebody messed with it. Um, I'm like, okay. So we turn everything on, let it warm up. And I plug my guitar in and 
And I, I just could not believe the sound uh, that was coming out of this amp. It, it was weird. It was really hard to describe. It was all I know was this like sustain. And I know Edward used that word a lot. You know, he was always looking for sustain. And that's the sound. It wasn't like preamp gain. Um, it was very natural, very big, but it wasn't super loud. But dude, everything, everything just bounced off that fretboard. Like I would turn the knob down and tap out harmonics, and they there was no effort required for, for those notes to come out. You know, if I would play through my, my Mesa Boogie Mark III, you know, you, you could tap them out because that's preamp game. But this guitar, I mean, the sound, there was this natural <clears throat> compression that everything, it just tapped it and then it just like bounces off like a tennis ball. You're like, oh my God. And just the tone, the warmth, it was big. And I just, I was blown away. Uh, it, it was just the best guitar tone experience I ever had. And I'll never forget that. You found the Holy Grail, you know, when, when yeah, it's it, it, like that. And the notes, just like you say, bounce off and there's sustain and all that and, and just inspires you to play, you know. And uh, you do you know what the Variac was set for? I don't remember. I don't remember. I just remember don't touch anything. And I remember, <laughs> like, you know, he told me that Mike's like, okay, dude, we got to stop because I don't know when he's going to come back. And I'm like, I didn't want to stop playing it. Like you said, it's very inspiring. I was just like, yeah playing riffs like i never knew like just stuff was just coming out and um but yeah it, it was just that sound i'll never forget it it's it's just hard to describe it, it, it's, it's just weird it's like there's distortion but there wasn't and there was power and sustain but it, it, it's like it's like what you hear like on those like fair warning is just like a power sound, but there's not that distortion is going to come out because you're pushing those power tubes and stuff and you got the very, but it's not, you know, what, you know, later, you know, when Edward started using the 5150s and everything turned more into like a preamp type of sound, it was just, it was just yeah. beautiful. I, I think that's, that's the way, I think that's the way most, most guitarists describe it when they find that, that magic compression in, hitting the power tubes hard instead of so much preamp gain when your preamp gain is not doing all the distortion it's only doing some of it so you're only getting partial clipping you know or, or soft clipping in the preamp but then you push the power amp and that's where that's where that tone comes from and that's why eddie had it in those you know on those amps where they weren't heavily modified they weren't heavily distorted and if you listen to van halen too it's almost it's almost bell like clean yeah, and some of the, and some of that, but when you hit when you turn that amp all the way up and you hit those power tubes, you know, and, and using the variac, you can dial down the overall voltage, so you got a little less volume, but it's still still doing the same thing. You know, when you when you hear that and play it and feel it, you know, you know that's that's the holy grail. <laughs> so yeah. so Kurt, yeah. when I was talking to Dave Freeman, we were talking about master volumes versus variac, um, because I you know of course I have remedial knowledge on all that part of it. Um, it, I have that new amp that I had built with the master volume, 73 Marshall master volume in the back. And I turn it down and then I turn up to two volumes, like an old plexi. Right. right. And I get that kind of thing where it compresses hard and I don't have to have the gain. So is a Variac similar in that or well, Variac allows you to reduce the whole, you know, the the voltage for the whole amp, which lower output means you can you can turn everything up more and have lower, more manageable volume, but you're still getting, you know, you're really pushing the output section from the preamp signal with the preamp signal, whereas just about any master volume, it doesn't matter who, whose version it is, you know, it's 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 got its limitations. It just does, you know. Uh, even when you put it post phase inverter, it's still not the real deal. And a variac, just the most common use of variac is using it in the mains to reduce the whole entire amp voltage. Whereas, you know, things like power scaling and all that, they're effective in a, in a certain regard, but you're only reducing voltage here or there. And there's there's a whole train of school that's like if you reduce your filament voltage too much, it's going to affect your tone, et cetera, et cetera. But just being able to crank a, an amp like a, a you know, 100 watt Marshall up all the way 
to get that is going to be really loud. Of course, there's solutions like isolation boxes and, and very X to a certain extent, but it's just, you know, it's, it's like probably even the very X apples and oranges. Really, it really is, you know, they both achieve similar results, but, you know, there's going to be limitations to any of that. I mean, when it comes down to it, you know, if you want a really good guitar tone like, like that, like Ruben described, you've got to have power tube distortion. You've got to have air moving in your speakers, you know. Right, right, right. Because th there's a Sunset Sound interview with uh, uh, Doug, was his messenger. And he walked in the studio during Fair Warning and Eddie said, hey, play my rig. And, and I don't know if you guys saw that, but I told Ruben this, I think, in our interview that that when Doug picked up his guitar, he explained exactly what Ruben just explained about that. And Eddie was telling him, look how easy it is for me to do this. You know, look yeah. how responsive it, it is to me. And he kind of found that, you know, I, I don't know if he found that back in the first, you know, album era, but definitely by fair warning, he had it kind of figured out what he, what he yeah. wanted to do there. And uh, yeah. So you think the very act is probably the most important part of that. Well, it is an important part of that, but your speakers are just as important. Your cabinet and everything, it's all part of the equation. And okay. any piece of the equation is just as equally as important, whether it's the guitar, the pickup, whether it's the amp itself, whether it's the tubes, whether it's the variac or the, the speakers. You know, it's all part of that equation. And just right. Uh, right. Eddie found it. You know, he, he found the way to do that. And like Ruben explained, you know, when you, when you find that setup, it's effortless to play, almost effortless. And he had such great hands you know just strong hands and you can hear that on like he said on the solo to uh the end of uh fair warning one foot out the door i mean when you hear that you know when don landy was recording that with him and he cut that and they stopped he probably looked at don and said how did i do that you know that kind of and don was probably sitting there with his mouth open guy how did you do that you Keep it. we're keeping that <laughs> <laughs> Stop. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I think you did that a lot with that, you know, hearing the eruption, you know, oh, the, yeah. the raw eruption thing and hearing just that tiny bit of feedback that's not on the records. You you hear that, you hear it in the room, and then you, you there's now that new one that came out that's just a cabinet mic, you know, the, that's our close up with no reverb, you know. Yeah. It, it's uh it's amazing, you know, like how how like we talked about with their live play, and they were so tuned up by playing live all the time that they were always especially when those early days when they were touring so much these guys were like so sharp and they were already sharp but they went out on tour and man they just you know when they come back sometimes they was it van halen too they didn't have much time they came off the road and they just decided to go in there and go ahead and do it while they were sharp and just yeah. knock it out you know i think they did that throughout their career and they like the whole thing with pretty woman and how that turned into the diver down album they were you know, I think they didn't intend to to record that album, but they but they ended up doing it anyway when they had just come kind of off uh, either hiatus or tour. I can't remember exactly that that detail, but but they did it a lot and they were super sharp, you know, all the time. You know, and Eddie did, you know, Eddie practiced all the time with his even later in life, as we know from a lot of the people that talk about being there with him. That's all he did, man. That's all he did was play guitar. You know, even yeah. when even when he, when he was in his bad era when he was having trouble he was still playing every day or you know very regularly full sets and you know still staying tight he knew about that he knew he needed to do that that's amazing stuff you guys i appreciate you coming on today man both y'all and um you know kurt you and i've known you for known each other for gosh man a long time and uh i appreciate your friendship and being on you know, I, I I didn't say this today yet, but Kurt Granger was the very first podcast guest I ever had. <laughs> oh, nice! <laughs> it's a, good to be back. All right, the very first guy, and and we and it was when I was just doing starting to do musician interviews, and Kurt Kurt was the very first guy he came here to the house. We even shot some videos on his amps that he builds. And uh, hung out that day, and we talked a little bit about the US Festival that day, and hung out and played a little bit. And uh, so, thanks for being with me. For I mean, it's it's amazing that that's gone by so fast. To be honest with you, man. And and really, you it helped is. you helped me get started. So thank you for that. And I know our Van Halen brotherhood. You know, we always had that from the very beginning. Oh yeah. And Ruben, man, you you know you were also one of the first people that you know reached out to me about that situation you had and and we got together and i appreciate you 
and and your uh, contributions to the to the to this journey of Van Halen that I you know I really didn't think this would be something I'd end up doing <laughs> or building a new <laughs> podcast studio for. But it uh, seems thank like you, man. No. It seems like this subject matter could be <laughs> talked about by so many people for so long that I guess I was going to just do what uh do what it's taking me down the road to do. So whatever I can dig up and give to the people that we haven't found out yet, and then there seems to be thousands of details that we don't know still. So it's it's an amazing. Yeah, thing. Thank, 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 thanks, Jeff. I appreciate you asking me back uh, when you sure. said you know you want to do this again. I'm like I'm there. I, I could literally. We can talk for the rest of the weekend, stay on here and talk Van Halen. Right, and, uh, right. Uh, no joke. <laughs> there, there's so many little things here and there that we can branch off on. But I, uh, I, I love it. I had a great time. Thank it's you. And, and I wanted to congratulate you. I know you hit like over 10K subscribers some time back. So that's yeah, actually, that's for, awesome. I think we're over 13, <laughs> almost 14,000 now. And then uh, really, awesome. yeah, awesome, Jim. 14,000. And the biggest view so far was, uh, well, there's, oh, there's over, over a million views on this series man that's yeah. nice that's, that's great. great dude congratulations yeah, over the you know the entire 33 or now 33 episodes there's over a million views i, I didn't even know that until i kind of like had to go back through and count and i was like whoa i didn't realize we were that many people had tuned in it's just amazing to think that the, the us festival times two or three has seen these shows <laughs> that's freaky right it's in, in, incredible technology to be able to do that and be able to share that with the world and anything else i can find out from the people who were there man and and, and people who were there with him along the way people who were with him you know I, i've had some really close guests that that if i ever get you're just gonna be shocked of some of the stuff that i i so close to getting you know and <laughs> and and uh but you know a lot of people are still careful about um the timing of it because of you know i know it's been a, it's been a while since 80 passed but a lot of people are not quite there yet with that so uh and his son be one of those people you know I, i've reached out to his son through his awesome. uh, publicist and i haven't been able to make that happen but i hope to one point you know and I, I think i think that wolfgang van halen when i met him he seems such a student of his dad's history, you know, and, and like we are, you know, like he does no detail. And with the company, you know, with EVH gear, uh, Matt and him are, are, like they said, trying to meet his father's expectations of what they knew his dad would want. So they're, they're, they're keeping it real there. And, and I'm glad for him and what he's doing and his whole career. Obviously I went to see him a bunch of times and uh, he's fantastic growing every day that band's like you know like when i saw him a second time or third time i thought yeah you you're 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 freaking tightening up like hell now you're fixing to tear the world apart man because this guy was just you, you the singing was what blew me away you know when i saw him in 07 ruben when that show you were talking about i saw the first show right and our, our uh i saw the first show but i also saw a show in atlanta where i did the vip and they took me back for the sound check Ooh. right and when I walked in, they were doing I'll Wait, and Wolfgang was singing lead. Wow. Oh, man. Because, you know, and David would never sing during soundcheck. But Wolfgang yeah. was singing lead. And, uh, and, you know, and Eddie and him were doing the backgrounds. But but uh, it, I was like, wow, I'm watching Wolfgang sing lead, and he sounds fantastic. And this is when he was like 17 or 18, right? Yeah. And uh, so it wasn't a huge surprise to me that he would become a, a great singer, but – the way his voice has even improved, you know, over the last few years and the way it's become its own thing. It's pretty amazing. And the success he's had, it's insane, but, but you guys, I appreciate it, man. Y'all, you, you, you know, can reach out to me anytime. And, and as I go forward with this, I'm going to do some special things, you know, from, uh, you know, maybe Tonewood, which is something I have a big discussion about this week, which some people believe in, some people don't. And I was going to talk about more about the brown sound as we go down the road. So some of those things I'd like to have you guys involved in further. In oh, yeah. Yeah, we'll love that. And maybe have group discussions. I I'm going to have some of those. For th I'm not going to do them all the time, but I'm going to do them in, in spurs between single interviews. And because uh, I do love getting to do the group things. It's fun to do that. Maybe sometimes I do the the birthday one last year with a bunch of folks and, you know, maybe the, the annual uh, or the death date one and maybe – um, or like, I like the special shows where I like, I get with you guys and we go through 
the us festival you know there's people out there who went to the oakland shows that we see the videos from you know and i haven't ever done an episode on the oakland shows you know and i know a lot of people that uh were there and you know actually was it josh obrek who did all the early uh, uh interviews with eddie he was at the oakland show and he saw the girl they carry around in the video there's a girl on somebody's <laughs> arms that was one of his friend's daughters <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he, he was there so yeah yeah stuff like that that's the kind of things i'm thinking so it's kind of kind of creative but thanks for hanging out with me guys i know you got a got a weekend to go to and i appreciate your thanks, your, your friday afternoon you guys have a great day i'll get this out there and uh probably next week and uh let you both know and uh i hope that a lot of people will tune in and hear your great uh discussions about the s festival because man thanks. What, what an experience enjoy it Enjoy Thanks it. again. Thank you, guys. Take care, Kurt. Good meeting you guys. Take care. See you guys. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.